put myself in a context, I'm actually probably more a practitioner for a long time than I've been a scholar. I basically got my PhD 20 years ago and then went working into think tanks and grassroots organizations. My involvement with Afghanistan has been fairly hands-on. Um, I went first in 2000 as a Taliban and then got interested you know, in, in promoting something for a window of opportunity because I felt in humanitarian condition you can't prepare for when a window opens to the <coughs> Taliban, you need to work with people on the ground to engage them if something happens. It was too late then because 2001 changed everything in Afghanistan when the US decided to simply take out the Taliban regime and start from scratch. Um, of course, history should teach us it's very hard to ever start from scratch in a country, even if you take out a regime. And you probably should never really assume that you could do that. Um, and you probably should always understand that you need to know history to, to do something in a country. Um, you can't assume you have a blank slate, but people literally assumed they had a blank slate in Afghanistan and literally could create a vision they had for the country. And I've seen that before um, when I looked at Nicaragua, you know, with an engagement there as well after the, the revolution, that people always think there is something they can create. I call it the sandbox um, phenomenon of internationals where you think you can go into a sandbox and build a castle out of sand, so with no conditions in it. Um, I was actually at Bonn, which is 2001 peace agreement, and that, uh, and that, that already is, is where my story starts, with my engagement very much at the grassroots level, very much with civil society, with the Afghan people. So my engagement has been very much bottom up, in the sense of the true sense, what I see democracy, which is basically participation at a broader scale of the people. I'm a sociologist, I'm by no means an electoral expert, and Afghanistan over the last years has taught me quite a bit why even states function or don't function, and many things that we personally take for granted at home, why they maybe don't get to work in these countries. It also has taught me to some degree that I feel, for some reason, Western actors seem to sell out democracy. I've called that democracy light. If I ever write a book, it'll be called Democracy Light, the biggest Western export since Coca-Cola. Because I do believe there seems to be something where we forget how democracy was formed in the West, how important the participation of people in democracies really is to form the vision of a country, and that is not just <laughs> um, an issue for elites. And that is part of the story of the paper. So the reason why I have a PowerPoint, because in many ways it's fairly anecdotal, myself having worked on the ground with Afghan actors on the early elections and having observed basically everything um, until recently I left the country in late 2014 and then joined UNSW. You've been trying to write up a bit my experience. Um, I've had some help in the framing because I'm not an electoral um, expert. She's not here, but you probably most know her. It's Car Caroline Van Ham, and also Astrid has been helping me a bit. She's, edit she's one of the editors, especially the issue that will come out, and she'll say more about that later. Um, what I was trying to show in my paper is to counter that argument that, you know, that when the West pulled out, that they thought the Afghans just don't get it, which is a very blanket statement, right? When something doesn't work, the people are not ready for democracy, they're too backward, they just don't understand democratic ideals, um, and they just don't seem to want it, and you know, then they can't be helped. And you may, you, you all probably don't think that, but you'll be surprised how increasingly you actually see that from certain political actors to explain why potentially after 14 years of international engagement and democracy promotion, we had a situation in a very deadlock in Afghanistan where things could fall apart again, where we had the bloodiest year since 2001. Displacement is high up again, and the new formed unity government that was based on a compromise after a very fraudulent election is not functioning very well. And, and the very people that the West had wanted um, is basically falling back into the neo-patrial patronage network. So it's always the assumption that um, you can pick a person, I think it's part of the problem the West had, this king making, that you pick a person and champion them and they, the democracy will somehow follow another system. So that's just to say. So what Afghanistan has created is because of, in my opinion, not trusting the true force of democracy in the people, not trusting that actually having 
true elections in a democratic process <coughs> will have the best outcome for Afghanistan because many fear that it will lead to uh, you know, Islamic fundamentalism and it will turn back Afghanistan to the Taliban. Um, people made deals with elites and kind of sugarcoated it, it in, in some Western elections over time. And, and then these elites, some of them handpicked by the West or favored by the West, and became manipulating the institution. And we create neopatrimonialism, as you all know, which is basically a negative hybridity at all. And what we see is a widening gap between the Afghan citizen and the government. And you have a situation in Afghanistan mm -hmm. right now where there is really no leadership, neither the government, nor actually the Taliban insurgency that has legitimacy to the people. So if you'd ask the people on the ground, and I'm working on a paper right now on Taliban community relationship, is they would prefer neither. They would prefer a third option. Of course, there is no third option, which is why there is no answer right now in Afghanistan. But I believe you have to think in, another, in the current peace talks, you don't do again what happened in Bonn, that you create an agreement between illegitimate actors that will not deliver to the Afghan people what they ultimately want. That you need to be very careful about it. So, now is Afghanistan, you know, as I say, history matter, um, does it even have democratic experience? And I think here it depends how you look at democracy or participation as such. Um, obviously, it didn't have the Western form of democracy with elections because Afghanistan was ruled by a monarch. And that monarch particularly came not just from the Pashtuns, that monarch came from one particularly sub-confederation, sub-tribe, it was a history that always the monarch came from basically the Mahmoud Zai clan, with a few exceptions. And most of the leadership changes in Afghanistan were either by leaders dying, passing on to sons, or um, being, <coughs> um, being forcefully you know, ousted, and most of them have been violent. There have been very few peaceful transitions of power in Afghanistan, which is important to understand. Um, and that's at the national level. Very, very few, some people count four, and most of these have been from father to son. Otherwise, has been coups and other issues. Um, so there has always been a fiercely contested leadership, but there have been peaceful situations in Afghanistan, and I think where we have seen democracy is actually at the grassroots level. There is a traditional system systems of governance and while the West looked down upon it because it is only accessible to men of a certain age of standing, if you go back historically in the um, evolution of democracy in Europe, that's how it started, right? It was men of a certain age of standing that called the shots in Europe, and that's how democracy developed, and later then, you know, other actors were able to be part of that democracy. We didn't have a broad-based democracy. But in that system, which is called Shura and Jurga, Shura is a steady council of elders. Jurga is a more is an ad hoc council. It's called to resolve problems. It is basically issues are discussed openly. There are certain characteristics that get you part of being of a Shura, and it's a collective decision. It has to be agreed by everybody in that circle. So it's kind of the circle of democracy traditionally. So they literally sit in a circle if you see that. And they understand that participation. They also understand what gets you in that participation and what gets you out of that participation. But yes, it is men of a certain age of standing. I repeat that because people always just emphasize the exclusion of women. It also excluded young men. And I think that's very important to remember. It's not just women. Right? There's exclusions on various levels. It also extended laborers. So we had this, it's a landed elite system. You have the Khans, and then you have the people that worked the land. They weren't allowed to vote either. It's the landowners that were. So that's important, and the religious leader, of course, as well. So in these, that's what we have to understand. But there is, I think, an understanding of what it means to participate. And I, when I engaged with Ellis, I did understand what it means you know, to have something. Now, let's start at Bonn. Bonn didn't, a peace agreement should be inclusive. The Taliban wasn't there. Not even all of the actors in there were there. Basically, you had the very people that had been pushed up by the Taliban. At that point, they controlled 10% of the country in Afghanistan, and they weren't liked by the Afghan people. So what the UN then did, and this is partially where I think some of the meddling probably started, is to say we need civil society. So they couldn't bring them on the main, I call it on the top of the hill, and we were literally in the bottom of the hill. They couldn't get them to the real meeting. So that's when I got a call and was asked to hold that meeting. I had 10 days 
Now, to make a, you know, a fully representative meeting of civil society actors in 10 days, when you have to get them outside Afghanistan into Germany, many not having passports, it was quite a few, I didn't sleep much, it was very interesting. Now, I was a true believer at that stage, thinking, oh, great, we get these people to talk, and there'll be some recommendations, there'll be some input, you know, that can go forth, that maybe the, the, the whatever on top could be heated. Until I got the call from the UN and said, well, you know, here would be what I think should come out of your meeting. And I literally said back, I'm really sorry, you can ask me to facilitate the meeting. I'm not going to put words in people's mouths. They will come out with whatever happened. So that, when I realized for the first time, you know, and you can say I was fairly naive then, that there was a certain instrumentalization to tick the box of having a participation, to have that ad added element of civil society actors, but trying to control it because they couldn't control the political elite up on the hill. Because there it really went of who controlled what territory, who, was, who, who had to take Kabul, and then ministers were just given out. Like, uh, as really William Malley always does, for fitting the door prizes at a children's birthday party. So there wasn't really a cohesive decision. However, in our meeting, we decided to set up the Afghan Civil Society Forum, which I then went back to Afghanistan to set up and facilitate, to get involved, a larger involvement in, in, in the democratic process. And that's what I did for the early years in Afghanistan. We got involved in the constitution-making process, which was a, a second <coughs> opportunity to involve the people in, in shaping the future of the country, as well as providing education about you know, the first election in 2004 and in 2005. Now again, you know, call me naive, you know, I've mobilized um, local grassroots organization and we had a great plan to try to reach out broad-based over Afghanistan to consult what they would think their country should look like. Of course, there was nothing to consult on because, and I, I discussed it with the Constitution Commission, whether we could give people options, options of how a state could look like aside from what they've seen in the past, but at that point, there was a vision of the West that there weren't options. You couldn't envision, for example, a cons even a constitutional monarchy because they didn't want a monarchy. And that's a lot to do because the Americans, of course, were a lot of the people putting money into the system. And I think for them, that, that was not an outcome, not the best outcome that they envisioned. Um, and I literally, we struggled trying to have, literally to give people ideas. And we were confronted with elites within the UN, but also then in the Afghan government, that literally thought Afghan people were too stupid to know what they wanted, or they wouldn't really know how to govern their own country. And they had to be told what was best for them, which was, of course, a very you know, elitish pat patrimonial system. And when, I said, and, and when I said to them, well, you know, well, can't you take some input? and then maybe you develop it in your constitutional language, they will want to know what, what they have. Um, and that already then created some tension and also created a fear among within the UN that a consultation on our behalf could unleash the fundamentalist beast. And we literally nearly were forbidden to do a wide consultation because they wouldn't trust civil society actors to actually not manipulate outcomes or they felt that maybe they couldn't control us. So in the end, we had to do a quasi-consultation. So while some of the Constitution commissioners did their own consultation, it wasn't until Yash Gai entered the playing field that he realized that an opportunity had been lost, and he tried to salvage in the last stages some, to like, get some input from the consultation we have by holding a big meeting in Kabul and getting some input. How much it really made into the Constitution, I frankly don't know, because there was little transparency of what made into it because there have been various scripts. One was written by a French scholar given to Karzai. Others were, were involved by Western scholars. Von Rulon was probably involved with it. So there was a lot of backdoor dealing in it. Um, we were also approached to bring women actors together to have a co co coherent voice on what they wanted for you know women in the Constitution. It was very hard because, of course, the mistake was made again. Afghan women are a homogeneous. There are multiple voices, the diversity of voices, up to the point that the women in the constitutional lawyer jirga lobbying for the hijab is being part of the constitution. But the West thought you could then bring them all together and you could have messages, ideally messages, that were given like that. So we entered the constitutional lawyer jirga having lost another opportunity at creating this democratic vision of Afghanistan that could come bottom up from the people, at least for the input. 
and we were dealing with a test text that was literally based, although it was based on the 1964 constitution, we had a good, good constitution, um, was then highly contested, and literally a tit for tat happened. You know, the Americans and Karzai wanted a presidential system because they wanted Karzai to be the leader of the new country. That was literally a given. Um, and he had to play an ethnic card to get that. He had to play the Pashtun card to get the votes of the Pashtun. That, of course, made all the other ethnic groups nearly walk out of the, the non-Pashtuns, out of the constitutional lawyer, Jürger. Until then, they started making compromises. So you started having this horse stealing in a constitutional setting on the ground between the actors. Then there was horse stealing between the jihadists, you know, the people that fought versus the expats, you know. The, everybody said for ministerial positions, for example, you need to you need to have a certain education. Then the other said, well, yeah, but then you have to give up your foreign passport. So there was this whole horse trading going on. To this date, I believe that the um, issues on women's rights were literally forgotten to be scratched out of the constitution because the men were too busy fighting on a higher level over who was controlling the narrative within the constitution. But it was Karzai who was here to stay. And just to backtrack a bit, Karzai was the one who was appointed to a temporary government by international actors in Bonn. He was a Pashtun from the south. And everybody thought he needed a Pashtun from the south. We always joked that it needed a Pashtun from the south that had a beard and you could never see his wife, which made Santa Claus a quite fitting prospect, you know, because he was also liked in the north. Um, there was before the Constitution, another grand meeting, because what they actually did, and I probably should have backed up, what they did is that they borrowed the idea of the, of the jurga, the grand jurga, the lawyer jurga, which is the gathering of people. And actually, before the Constitution, lawyer jurga, they tried to confirm Karzai. People went out wide, and there was a le bottom-up electoral process for the delegates that made it into the jurga, in the assumption they could actually elect a leader. Not in the assumption to confirm Karzai, but the international then, like I say, the track was throughout that Karzai had to be confirmed because he was the only leader the West think was feasible for Afghanistan and for some of the Afghan actors. And what happened in that before, the, the, as I said with the constitution already, was that the king had been nominated, the old the former king. And then an Afghan American who was working with the National Security Council of the United States walked into the king's house asking to stand down. Because everybody knew the king was a candidate vis a vis Karzai, he would win. Because the last time of peace and prosperity in Afghanistan, people remembered the king. So it was the Americans that stood, stood down the king, and then Karzai won the emergency lawyer Jurga. And it was again a background dealing that got, um, that got, Kar got Karzai confirmed in the presidential system in the constitution lawyer Jurga. So you see a long process of using Afghan institutions. Um, where on the, on the ground people actually put their face in it and actually vote and engage with it being manipulated in the end. So it was fairly m very, very much window dressing and it cost a lot of money. You have to imagine what it costs to go out and get people to elect people, to have consultations and everything. And, um, and in the end it was simply to confirm a system based on a leader they wanted. How bizarre is that? I thought that was one of the most bizarre things. Um, I, again, I don't know much about political systems, but the way I read Afghanistan, you need something like Canton Switzerland or Federal Germany, which is a lot more local autonomy and not a strong centralized system around, the president, uh, around a president like in the US, because Afghanistan is fragmented. You don't even have the transportation linkages. It's always been ruled from bottom up, where certain regional leaders had deals with the kings. The king never reached out everywhere. The Afghan state never reached into rural areas. So why would you do it after a war when everything had been destroyed? So that set up to the fact that in that, after the constitutional lawyer Jurga, the step was for the first election. You have to also think of the time frame: 2001, end of year, on agreement. Two, end of 2003, constitutional lawyer Jurga, new constitution, 2004 presidential elections. I'm not sure about you, I'm getting breathless even talking about it. Because in that time, after three decades of war, 
people having had experience to actually have to elect the leader, you were simply just rushing them through a progress that you felt needed to be done to pacify the country. We were engaged in the civic education effort out there for the elections, and what we actually wanted to do is tell people how the Constitution looked. We wanted to tell the Afghan citizens in the civic education um, what it meant to be a citizen under the new system, what was their responsibilities vis-a-vis um, -vis the state, and what responsibility the states vis-a-vis -vis -vis had them. We worked together with the United Nations. That was the largest, um, one of the largest civic education efforts. Um, and in the end, the, what the UN basically wanted is just wanted to tell the people how to vote. There wasn't anything to really explain the system to them, really responsibilities. It was literally about, this is where you go, this is how you vote, <coughs> fractionally going away from telling people that they had to vote. <laughs> and I never understood how civic education had become simply a voter education. At that point, we had a bit more resources. We could sneak in a bit of the other education out there. So people went out, there were many candidates, but Karzai was the most viable option. And I would still say, although there was some irregularity in 2004, people did see Karzai as the option. But also because Afghans are quite astute in how horse trading works. At that point, a lot of them had gotten the message that the West was behind Karzai. And if Afghanistan was to spec a lot of reconstruction money, you had to vote for Karzai. And we saw that when we looked at to how politicking went. In 2004, compared to any of the other presidential elections, a lot was placed on vote for Karzai, reconstruction money will follow. You can call it a bribe, etc. And that broke up a later because when you don't hold your promises, it breaks apart. Then 2005 came. And I'll end here with the 2005 because the other election we've heard so much about that was the first parliamentary elections. Okay, so until now people had been cheated out of, a, of really having the representation they wanted. So this was the possible to get the parliamentarians that you wanted. Until there was a problem with due process. Now, an electoral law had been crafted that said you could not stand for election if you had committed crimes against humanity or war crimes. Of course, for that to work, you had to be accused, tried, and convicted. The Afghan justice system at that stage, we're talking 2005, was nearly, hadn't been reformed, it was not nearly even close enough. So while the UN tried to vet some people out, they only could vet out the people that had links to arms groups. They couldn't really vet out people that maybe was twice removed from it, but had committed war crimes, nevertheless. Now, if you can, discussing that with the people in our second civic education when we went out again in 2005, they had a hard time understanding that. For them, they knew that some of the people that were standing were war criminals, that they didn't want to see representing their country, that were manipulating, the, that would they manipulate the war on the ground. And they didn't understand that international actors were supporting a system that put warlords into parliament. And you, you can blame it. I mean, if you talk, I talked to the Complaints Commission, Electoral Commission, they always felt they were working within a system that had been created, yet the system was premature for a country that hadn't even performed its institution, had a strong institution to support laws. You know, laws don't mean nothing unless you can implement them. And so for the Afghan people, they felt there was the UN, which represents the, the Western actors, that actually um, was complicit in bringing warlords into parliament, robbing them a third time, or if you say bond, Con um, emergency lawyer jurga, constitutional lawyer jurga, presidential elections will say that they were okay with that, a fourth time, of actually being able to, to participate in free and fair election. And by then, in 2005, the language of the West had already slipped. Because at that point, there was violence that started happening. The Taliban had started to research. It wasn't as easy as it was before anymore. And I saw the language slip from free and fair. I saw now you have secure to credible and acceptable. Credible and acceptable election. And um, I think later it slipped even further, but I can't think it was mostly just like, let's just do it and get it by. But the fact that so many people made it into parliament that could manipulate on the ground, that had links to armed groups, and was also linked to a complicated system, not actually allowing political parties, because people thought political parties would give the Mujahideen parties, the armed parties, an edge, but it also 
ruled out that any of new democratic, you know, grassroots parties could actually run and who could actually control the system because they had the resources without running for parties were the very parties that you actually wanted to keep out of the system. So a lot of bizarre things happen, including a single non-transferable vote system that I think, I don't know, you understand more than me about it. Um, at that point, I think we lost the Afghan people. At that point, I got out of doing civic education. I also got out of civic education because between 2004 and 2005, it literally had gotten to a box ticking, ticking exercise. It was run by UNOPS. There was a Danish gentleman that ran it that some people called the Danish Nazi, not me, other people. Um, it was run by UN volunteers on the ground that had my Afghan colleagues who were doing civic education had a hard time engaging with. It was to the point box ticking exercise that we were told that we had 50% female educators so the UN could write in their papers, 50% female civic educators. We had 30%. I was told that I wasn't a feminist because I couldn't make happen 50% until I explained to him, do you want to reach women? Or do you want to just tick a box because we had mullahs and elders that could reach women in the process? Um, to the fact that the UN didn't give us resources. There were areas where you had to helicopter the polling stations in, but they wouldn't take our civic educators. Our civic educators had to bribe themselves across the border of Tajikistan to reach areas the UN could helicopter in because they wouldn't take our civic educators, but they took their polling people. How you get people to a polling station understand elections if you don't take the civic educators with you is far beyond me. But you can see it was a fragmented process where the UN had a hard time working the civil society. Now, if you read reports later on, it's been hailed as a successful UN collaboration with civic society. Um, I've never been interviewed by people that evaluated the UN. They usually just talk to the UN people. But my experience was always that it was a top-down process. As much as we tried to push in from the bottom up, we hit our head against the wall. And that disenchanted Afghans to really engage. And that set up for the failure in 2009, which was extremely fraudulent. I didn't even bother monitoring that one. I was in Kabul, but I just thought it was going to have on. I monitored the 2014 election. And what I see in between my first election and monitoring 20, 2004 and 2014, that Afghan approach to election had changed. The people really knew what it was. The people wanted to participate. In 2014, they negotiated with the Taliban to actually be able to vote in some areas. They risked their lives to go out to vote because the Taliban was, was killing people or cutting people's finger off they were voting. Yet the elite never trusted the voting process. In any subsequent elections, <coughs> it was rigged or man manip manipulated ahead of the time. And at all times, there was a question among the Afghans, why did the West support a system like that and didn't call the Afghan government out? So to come close with the anecdotal evidence, I think if you look at Afghanistan, it's not that they didn't understand elections and democracy. I think the general Afghan population understood it very well. And the reason why they disappointed with its own government and the West is because it was sold out. Because democracy in the true sense, or free or fair election in the true sense, was never ever delivered to them. So how can you put faith into a system when you get really literally sold a watered down version that, that gives elites the ability to manip manipulate because they think they have the best outcome. Why would you put your weight behind a system like that? Why would you keep pushing against a system that keeps you out, that's literally actually worse than some of the traditional systems where it was very clear what the rules were, how you could get in or not. So I'll end that because ASI will be much better in probably pulling it together. Um, and I think the importance for that, as we maybe go into Syria or Iraq, is, is that if you go into these areas, I think we have to be very careful what we are selling. I think for me, if you consider it, that democracy or election, it shouldn't even be a product, but I think the West has been selling it as a program, product. That's why I call it democracy light. That I think we're doing a disservice to democracy if we're selling it lightly and we're doing a disservice if we cannot guarantee the conditions to safeguard the very democratic ideal it's supposed to support. Because then something is broken and then what we're promoting is a broken system that is basically simply window dressing. Say it's Coca-Cola without the sugar. Um, okay, well, thank you. Um,
Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, I actually work in Norway for a research institute, Chris Helm Mikkelsen Institute. Uh, and uh, I haven't been working, and we have to do all kinds of research, applied research and so on. So I have not been working as uh, thoroughly on Afghanistan as to some. But longer. Uh, but longer. <laughs> so, um, and also, um, Susan's presentation is uh, an article which is going to be in a special issue of the journal Conflict Security and Development, which is all devoted to the elections in Afghanistan. And that is coming out uh, sometimes this year, inshallah. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. And the, the special issue is co-edited by myself and uh, Jonathan Goodhand, who some of you may know. He's at SOAS and also at Melbourne University now. Um, so uh, I have read Susan's uh, draft manuscript, and as she was emphasizing now, her version is a tale, a very sad tale, of elites versus the people. Uh, and uh, I want to pick up just two things on that. Uh, one is, uh, one general point is the role of elections as a tool of democratization. Uh, and the other one refers to or takes up some of the structural <coughs> constraints on democratization in a country that is as heavily dependent upon external support as Afghanistan is, which I think is very important. Let me take the first uh, uh, point first. Um, elite versus the people. Uh, an argument which is often made with respect to the 2014 elections in Afghanistan, which were more fraudulent than the previous ones, people talk about industrial scale fraud, uh, is that what do you expect? Because the political system is, if you take a Douglas North analysis, is a limited access order, where social order is basically maintained through intra and inter-elite bargaining, uh, to the extent that elections questions or throws into uh, doubt this system, the elites will obviously organize the people and organize the world and manipulate the world. So if you have formal democratic, liberal democratic institutions in the limited access order, you get industrial scale election fraud. That is the analysis which uses uh, a Douglas North perspective. Uh, and uh, there's a very interesting, uh, again, article developing that view in the special issue of this journal, which I'm <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's an important point because it raises the further question, uh, how, how is the constituent, how are the constituencies organized? The, the key issue in a democratic uh, system is organization of the voting public. Uh, and the key element in the Afghan situation is that you don't have functioning political parties. Uh, you certainly, they don't have a formal vote in the present uh, system because in 2005, the very esoteric system of a single non-transferable vote was introduced, which, and you were not allowed to stand on a political party platform, but only as an individual candidate. So the result, in terms of parliamentary elections, was total fragmentation. Uh, so if you don't have political parties uh, as a vehicle for channeling interests, and you know, for articulating and uh, uh, accumulating and aggregating interests, uh, what, what do you do? So the key question, I think, is, what are the possibilities, if you're interested in really promoting democrat democratic order in Afghanistan, how can you get instruments that can channel uh, votes and popular interest in ways that breaks this elite manipulation of the people? Uh, there are many reasons and complicated reasons why you don't have political parties operating in effectively, certainly, in Afghanistan today. Um, and we can talk. We can talk about that. But uh, many people argue that if you are going to move forward on the democratization agenda in Afghanistan, you really need to work on 
of political parties, to legalize political parties, to support the development of political parties, uh, and you need to change from an SNTV to a proportional representation in order to give parties uh, a chance to, to be represented as parties. Um, there are, of course, other ways of doing it. I mean, there's a corporatist model. You can have quotas, for instance, in Parliament for youth and for workers and for women and so on. Um, but this has to be organized. I, I gather, I haven't worked much on Africa, but some of my colleagues at my institute have. And they've come to, come to Uganda under Museveni in the first period. There's someone here working on Africa, I gather. Uh, that point to the cooperatist model where there were quotas for women, uh, men with disabilities, but after long, long wars there were lots of girls, uh, workers and so on, uh, in parliament. And this was organized top down, uh, but it after a while evolved into a genuine two-way kind of influence and model. Uh, because people had to be elected on the bottom up to district and provincial <coughs> and so on in order to run for quotas, for instance, for women in the parliament. But the point is that if you're going to have a corporatist, corporatist model like that, it has to be organized. Now, Museveni, you know, had an organization, he had a movement which was forged through many years of fighting a rebellion. Afghanistan in 2001, uh, Ha did not have a movement like that. The closest you had in Afghanistan in 2001 to that kind of movement was the Taliban. But uh, who, who, was it? who <laughs> wanted to touch the Taliban then? <laughs> uh, and even today, probably Taliban you know, is the strongest uh, movement in Afghanistan. So if you don't want to touch the Taliban and a corporatist model, and you don't want to have political uh, parties, in an election system that gives political parties uh, proper uh, credit, then you do get elite manipulation of the people. That's what you get. Um, so that's, that's one point. Um, the other point I wanted to is to go to beyond elections, and I'm not an election expert by any means, uh, is um, to think about the conditions that are suitable for a liberal political democracy. Uh, we talk about Charles Tilley, oil field or garden. Uh, and you know, Charles Tilley always says something very useful, and I think his metaphor there has also been you know, with me for a long time. But the key in Afghanistan, uh, particularly in the case of the power of the parliament, uh, but also of the president, is that there is so little autonomy uh, because up to 80% roughly of all public expenditure comes from foreign transfer, foreign public transfer, foreign, foreign aid. Uh, and that has been more or less stable as a percentage since 2001. Uh, in terms of the national budget, the government uh, finances about 40% out of national revenues. But the national budget only covers very little of total national expenditures because there's so much off budget money that comes from donor money going directly into important developments. Uh, so in terms of economic policy, the president, and particularly the parliament, has very little say because they don't know how much money they have to handle. <laughs> uh, and the parliamentary power in relation to you know, power of the purse is very, very limited. Now, that does not encourage parliamentarians to play the kind of role which we expect parliamentarians to do. Uh, they recognize, realistically, that they are there, they have a much more limited power, namely as a broker between uh, the channels of influence and their constituency. When it comes to defense, the other key function of a government, there is again very little autonomy. Uh, the joke now is that uh, the commander of ISAC, the American, the new one, Nichols, uh, is the Afghan Minister of Defense. Uh, the Afghan security forces are heavily dependent uh, in operational terms 
on foreign air power still. Uh, and they are totally dependent in financial terms on financing from the United States and some European allies. So in terms of defense as well as development, there is very little autonomy for the government. Uh, now, in that situation, uh, if you say, if you, if you assume that accountability follows the flow of money, the main incentives for the government to be accountable is not to their own people, but to foreign donors. Because that is where the power with respect to both development and uh, defense ultimately lies, or not even ultimately. So under those conditions, uh, what does democracy mean? And those are some of the more <coughs> fundamental issues, I think, uh, we need to <coughs> think through when we talk about democratization in a country like Afghanistan. Uh, Susan was mentioning that the new leader was falling back into uh, patronage politics. Well, of course. Uh, that's, that's your room for maneuver. Uh, and that's what, you know, per se, uh, in order to reduce some of his dependence upon the United States, when he came in, he even had an American bodyguard, which was very demeaning. In order to reduce his dependence upon the United States, he developed local patronage through all kinds of uh, means which were uh, not always the kinds we would like. Uh, but that is the logic of the system. And that, I think, is a much broader problem than uh, uh, some of the other, or the more fundamental underlying problems. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you.